Hello and welcome to this second meeting of Benny's Declaration of Signatories. I think we all remember how we left Curitiba only 16 months ago after two days of interesting discussions and a final event that produced the Curitiba Manifesto, a real commitment to what cities need to be in the future. But we didn't expect what was about to come. The unprecedented and difficult times the pandemic brought to our lives has helped us to understand even better that this society we were so proud of is not as idyllic as we thought in terms of equality, freedom and ecology. Three aspects that the Curitiba Manifesto highlights as the axis of future sustainable urban environments in the context of sustainable goal number 11. The family perspective appears to be the correct answer to a holistic approach, as the family unit has proven to be the main agent for development societies and the cornerstone for sustainable cities. As we have proven with our project on SDGs and families, family policies are a mainstay of national public policies and the most meaningful bake of governments to influence the living standards of upcoming generations. That would be the right way to establish equality, freedom, ecology, and to reach all members of society, leaving no one behind. We are presenting today the first monitoring report of the project and showcasing some good practices by every signatory of the Venice Declaration. I want to thank the Veneto region and especially Mr. Roberto Ciambetti for their ongoing leadership and inspiration, highlighted in a special way during these past months by their strategy during the pandemic and also for, by the law for the support of family and natality which can be a guide for many other territories to implement a family perspective. The report and the practices shown today will be presented next World Cities Day to the United Nations. They represent a step forward while we expect the next meeting to be presential and we take advantage of the present situation to consolidate the social protection especially needed in today's world. I want also to thank all of you for your ongoing work and effort during these hard times. The past will probably not come again exactly as it was, and the present is not what we want to keep. We can't change that, but it is the future that depends on how we use all those lessons to promote a new set of rules and the family values detailed in different aspects along the Venice Declaration, look now as the best guide for it, for making the invisible visible and realize that most of what was visible up to now has become irrelevant. This is and will be the real challenge for local and regional governments during the next years. We need to develop and deepen each of those points, show how relevant they have become and spread the contents to other territories that can join our project. I take advantage on, of this occasion to thank all the external participants in the meeting and invite them to consider sending the declaration and to all of us to find new partners and stakeholders that can be part of this endeavor. And with this, I give the floor to the team that has been in charge of producing the report and um, evaluating the work all of you have done. Let me introduce you 
to uh, Wilson Levy and Jose Eduardo Staropoli from the University Nove de Giulio, Uni Nove, who will explain more in detail uh, how the report has been done. Thank you very much. Good morning. I would like to greet everyone, especially my friend Inácio Socias, on whose behalf I greet everyone present. My name is Wilson Levy, and I am the director of the master's degree in Smart and Sustainable Cities at Uninove. Our institution, Universidade 9 de Julho, is IFFD's academic partner in this project. Uninove is a university that is organized in the form of a private association, non-profit. Create, created more than six decades ago, uh, it is maintained by a family that committed to the mission of providing quality educa educational inclusion uh, and decisive social impact. Reached more than 200,000 students at all levels of education from basic education to POD, many of which are the first in the family to reach the higher education level. Headquartered in Sao Paulo, the largest city in Brazil and South America, with more than, than 11 million inhabitants, Uninove awards more than 30,000 scholarships and ensures that the training of students at stricto sensu graduate programs, masters and doctorates is fully subsidized with all resources. All students enrolled in this training stage are scholarship holders at the institution. In the context of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, this project demonstrates two important things. The first, that the territories of cities in an urban world is the place where the greatest challenges for families are concretely manifested. The second is that good practices are occurring in various parts of the world and they need to be made visible. As a scientist, we must understand them, identify their potential, support their strengthening and develop solution to the challenges that arise. Uh, that was uh, uh, everything. And if anybody has any questions about the, the procedures or the analysis, we will happily answer them. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any questions now. After, we will have also a chance to go for them. If you, if you have any, anything you, you want to ask or to comment, you can do it through the chat, I guess, too. Or just address directly to us, because this is a meeting of, of the project. So now we are starting this best practice showcase and the first one will be the, done by Antonio Francina who is the head of the press office of the Beneto uh, region. Antonio you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed and very happy to meet you. If, uh, even if we are distant, uh, a common ideal unites us, the value we give to the human being and, of course, to the family. To this, I add the sincere affection and the esteem I feel for the many friends I see today and whom I always hope to meet again as soon as possible. Thanks to Ignacio Socias 
first of all, to the IFFD, thanks to Uninove, to Jose and Wilson, thanks to the Elisa Network, and to all of you. I repeat, I want to meet you again as soon as possible. COVID-19 has highlighted the limitation of our old development model. Today, we have to reinvent a way of being together. And this new way starts from the family, from safe and dignified homes and from cities with eco-sustainable and supportive models of life which support community life. At its center lies the human being and precisely the family and all its members. The experience we gained in this year leads to a profound deep reorganization of our society, starting with a health care system based on local territorial care developed with a network of basic services, community hospitals, clinics, mental health centers, proximity centers, and so on, getting to be successful always closer to the citizen and the family. As a Veneto region, we try to identify strategies that can be positively tested both in advanced societies and in the poorest countries. Very useful strategies, not only in the case of pandemics like today with COVID-19, but always applicable. For this reason, we have identified as a strategic the provision of basic care services by integrated team, teams of professionals, doctors, nurses, specialists, first and above all for the care of patients at home, allowing, thanks to telecare, and remote hospitals to transform the home more and more into a place of care with obvious economic and social savings and high efficacy in therapies, prophylaxis, and healing. President Ciambetti, on behalf of Veneto Region, is presenting this strategy to the Committee of the Regions in Brussels to then bring it to the attention of the European Commission as a suggestion to include and support in its public health guidelines. We are therefore talking about a good practice that is ready to be tested in the years to come on a large scale, at least in Europe. This strategy is more likely to be successful if the family is stronger and adequately supported and trained, home and family, therefore, are also at the center of a new healthcare model and at the center of a new society, more deft and more attentive to the needs of the most vulnerable ones. The, this model of care which combines local territorial, territorial health care with basic telecare services can be applied everywhere in rich countries as well as in those countries where there are few advanced medical hospital structures. New technologies can be extraordinary in supporting families and also in developing new types of education, teaching, and distance learning. However, we have to pay attention. We must not make the mistake of focusing exclusively on the home, even if ensuring everyone a decent home remains 
why one of the biggest problems to be solved in the post COVID years. We should facilitate social links and all forms of community life, which are fundamental for the quality of life of all, from children to the elder. The home can't be transformed into a prison or into a gate. Let me give an example that might seem trivial, but uh, uh, is very cost and of easy application and may give uh, an indication of what uh, I think we need. Last December, UNESCO declared Tai Chi Chuang a world heritage. There are numerous studies that confirm the benefits of Tai Chi for psychophysical well-being and in the treatment of many diseases. Regardless, Tai Chi should be encouraged as a sport that is safe even for the elderly, as we see in China. Easy to learn, fun, and with the, all the potential to bring health benefit. And uh, sorry, I, as I am speaking about China, I take the opportunity to greet a professor for the University of Applied Sciences of Rotterdam, who recently organized a very successful seminar on healthy aging with the city of Shanghai. We have to learn from this seminar, I think. So, speaking of Tai Chi, what I want to see is that Tai Chi is a form of collective sport practice, which is to be done together in open spaces. It doesn't require special tools or means, special rooms, it needs only a good teacher. What I mean, it's a healthy, cheap sport practice, which allows the building of important social links. There are other four cultural forms of common disciplines. You mean other friends, and uh, I see some uh, government of uh, Southern Brazil can tell us what, what is uh, for all or uh, samba for the Brazilian, no? Before being a dance, they are a means to stay together, to share together, to live together. And this is important for our idea of new society. The aim is to strengthen community life around the family, containing cost, remote medicine that makes uh, the home, the place of care, is a practicable example for everyone. We are experimenting now in Veneto this kind of medicine. And I hope that this challenge will be accepted and relaunched by the European Union and, of course, by the United Nations. I don't want to waste your time. And I give the floor to Ignacio. Thank you, thank you very much for all these interesting ideas, Antonio. And, and now I just pass the floor to Mr. Um, sorry, to, to Mrs. Valdemira Grazano from the government of Paraná in Brazil. Uh, they were the hosts for our meeting last year, and we remember very well those days, also with a bit of saudade, which is <laughs> Typical. Uh, Mira, you have the floor. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm very good being here. I also remember with, uh, with a lot of care the days that we passed here together. We're going through here in Brazil, we're going through the worst moment uh, during the pandemic of COVID-19. We have been, uh, this comes since 2014 from a economical crisis that we have been, that we have, we 
been bringing till this moment? With millions and millions, with uh, thousands of families that lost their jobs and their dignity and their strength to live in society. Still now, our country has over almost 12 million infected um, people, a million seven hundred, seven thousand people. People die per day in, in 2000, during 2020 has been um, making measures, less violent measures per se, to um, deal with these types of issues than in comparison with other states. Due to our economy based in agriculture, in family agriculture, and having a 12% growth of agriculture in 2020, just as an example. <laughs> and because of the economic situ uh, circumstances of trade, um, the majority of this growth was exported. And like Mita said, uh, we accept did all others and all the reels that we could to sustain our economy, our state economy. But in the end of the year, we had the new variant of the Amazon of COVID-19, which has been which has been the a disaster for the past moment for the past months actually in the country. Not only the variants of Af uh, South Africa, for, for example, but also because of our variant of uh, the Amazon. So here we have one, sorry, Mira, what is the data? 746,000 people have been infected in the state of Paraná, uh, being one new infected every 40 seconds at this moment. Well, getting to our good practices before that, one of the most disastrous uh, effects and the family context was the the unemployment, the high rate of unemployment. So 12% of the economic active population is now unemployed in Brazil. being 9.8% uh, here in Paraná, the state of Paraná. So one of the main um, uh, principles of combating this type of problem was the, the, the meal issue, the food issue. So last year, Paraná has um, developed a uh, distribution of income uh, program uh, combined with the federal um, incentives. And one of the good practices that we um, like to, to, to set as an example was the distribution to of the school distribution meal to all families of students of the state's um, public education. É, nós distribuímos kits de alimentação, como vocês estão vendo na foto, 
para 217 mil famílias a cada 15 dias durante o ano todo. So we have distrib distributed um, this, this 50, sorry. 217 mil famílias receberam os kits a cada 15 dias. So 217,000 families have, have received during 19 stages uh, the distribution of meals every 15 days. E para concluir, um dos, conclude, um dos grandes resultados é que esses alimentos One of the great results was that these, uh, these um, agricultural goods, these meals, foram adquiridos é, boa parte da agricultura familiar que também é um elo de, de fragilidade. Were acquired over 70% from agricultural families, small families, which in our perspective is a form of income to guarantee to this population. É isso, muito obrigada pela atenção dos senhores. Yeah, that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mira. I think this was very interesting. And um, yeah, I take this opportunity to say that we will have in the website, of course, all the materials that you have already sent or that you can send in the next days for all of the rest to get to, to know much more about. This is just like a highlight to, to make you interested in them. Thank you very much. Now we move to Mr. Georgios Markopoulos. He's the president of the Union of Municipalities of the Attica region in Greece. And you will see that we're trying to deal with language difficulties in different ways. That's why some of the presenters have uh, decided to to record it in video, even most of them are present here today. So I leave you now with uh, Mr. Marco Paulus. Greece has confronted the pandemic crisis in a relatively favorable position. On the one hand, the government took the adequate decision on time and on the other hand, a large number of operational structures have already been developed to face the financial and social crisis my country has been suffering for a decade. The 66 municipalities of the Attica regions that I represent have been on the front line to face families' needs. Previously, local authorities adopted measures designed to deliver an effective, accessible, efficient, and resilient healthcare system. Moreover, we have also undertaken other actions concerning the strengthening of homeless shelter, the, the distribution of personal protective equipment and food. In a second time, we have adapted to new needs by offering free tests as well as free psychological support to anyone who needs it. After our experience in the management of the second wave of the pandemic, we consider the family as the privileged interlocutor to meet citizen needs, to carry out preventive actions, and to implement effective social solidarity policies. The recovery strategies of local authorities of the Attica regions will be based on the family unit as a multiplier to inform citizens to implement public health policies and to strengthen social cohesion. For this purpose, we plan to use new union funds that will be available soon through the mechanism of reconversion and resilience. During the pandemic, we have learned lessons that will allow us to be more effective in our future actions. Modernization of public administration, international cooperation, multi-level de democracy and local participation are essential elements of the governance model in order to start the pandemic. 
They are important both in addressing the current crisis and in ensuring a fair and sustainable recovery after the crisis. Social and economic recovery should involve all government levels in the extraordinary effort where the family is the key factor. We are aware of the effort that will be required for reconversion and we are preparing to meet the needs of vulnerable families, including single, par single parent families, large families and immigrant families. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much to Mr. Marco Polos. And the next presentation will be from Carinthia by Christine Gasler. As you know, Carinthia has been uh, granted the IFFD award this year for their work with children and family. And I'm sure we'll have a good example of what they are doing now. Christine, you have the floor. Let me now. Go ahead, please. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hi to all my colleagues around the globe. It's so nice to see you again. I miss you, I will say, first of all. And Ignacio, we are really thankful and proud that we get the award some weeks ago. Uh, it's really a win for us to be part of this uh, network and to be part of this interesting exchanges. It's really great. And uh, before I will start with my contribution, I have to bring you the best greetings of Beate Bretner, our Minister for Social Affairs and Health. She is uh, in another meeting now because she is Minister for Health and they have uh, uh, some topics to discuss. Uh, yes, what can I say? The COVID-19 pandemic uh, is also part of our life in Carinthia. Uh, we have actually uh, 1,413 new infections, today 132, and total we have now 30,000 Corinthian people with uh, infection of the uh, COVID-19. In Austria, we have nearly 500,000 infected persons. And uh, now I will uh, tell you something about uh, the impact of the pandemic on families, uh, children and uh, the youngsters, and in this context about the uh, niches of the Corinthian government. Uh, we have uh, now 91,000 children um, and youngsters under the age of uh, 18 living in nearly uh, 56,000 households, including nearly 11,000 single parent households. What are the burdens now? Home office and homeschooling, difficult soci socioeconomic development, unemployment, short time work, job insecurity, and eviction. Also, the loss of social contact, social isolation, and um, not all uh, the people have uh, the experiences with context via digital channels, and they have to learn this. And we see also the loss of daily structures. What now uh, the effects for Corinthian families, child and youngsters? Uh, we see, we have some researches, uh, therefore I can uh, present this. We see increase in mental abnormal, ab abnormalities and illnesses like uh, burnout symptoms, eating disorders, anxiety disorders, depression, aggression, compulsive behavior, even in children. We see a uh, problem problematic developments in the area of media consumption, consumption of addictive substances, both among children, uh, the youth and parents. Um, when the children are not in homeschooling, we see in the schools that there is a lack of motivation. We see drop in school performance and we see a school refusal. Uh, therefore, we expand in social workers in the schools. Uh, we see also increase of conflicts between the parents, 
and conflicts between parents and the children. Um, we see also increase of psychological and physical violence. And there's a uh, really increase of cases of cyberbullying, cyber grooming, uh, and hating uh, in the net. Um, so what we are doing, um, we see also that this is a very important topic too. Um, what is in the work for child and youth welfare? We see that um, we have more difficult to access the families with the compliance with security measures, avoidance of personal contacts by families. We see that there is an increasing demand for psychological and psychotherapeutic care. Uh, also demand for inpatient crisis admissions to the department uh, in the hospital. And we see also the loss of ther therapy measures. Uh, we see also the absence of, of the um, uh, specialists due to infections and or quarantine. And there is a successive increase in reports of danger. And uh, what we are doing now, we had opened another crisis intervention center in the east of our region. We have a crisis intervention community. We have uh, a new mobile crisis service. We have crisis foster parents and also uh, a new youth emergency service with overnight shelter. And uh, one of our best practice is uh, the early assistance. Uh, this early intervention service is aimed at pregnant women as well as mothers and fathers with children up to the age of three who find themselves in special life situations characteristic by very early or very late parenthood, insecurities in dealing with the respe respective child, children with development risks, excessive demands in this respect, and relationship conflicts, experiences of violence, and also psychological problems like anxiety and depression. By preventing such and other stress factors as early as possible and by strengthening parental and family resources the best possible development of children parenthood and family life is ensured this uh, offer already exists in eight of ten districts in our country and we will expand to all districts uh, during this year um, we are sure that with this early intervention we can help the families during this pandemic and uh, I hope we will uh, serve this. Yes, uh, I think this was a short presentation what we are doing now and uh, yes, I hope you will stay all well during the next time and we can uh, meet as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Christina. I think you expressed very well what we all feel today being here and seeing each other. Also, it was very nice to see this concern for younger people because many, many have said that though the elderly were the most directly affected, the younger people will be the, the most affected on the long term. And that is also very important, yeah. Uh, we had not this problem during the first lockdown last year in March and April. But uh, now, as the pandemic is so long, we see these problems really in, in a side we have, uh, how to say, uh, uh, we have difficulties, we see that. We will go now to Nodin Bade from the Département de bouche de Ron in France. And I will try to share your presentation okay. if you tell me when you want to, to change the, the slides. So. Next slide, please.
Okay, so we uh, on the department of uh, Bouche du Rhône, we try to focus on uh, the election of seniors. So for that, uh, the department has created new structures. We uh, called it Les Maisons du Bel Age, Senior Houses. And they try to invent a new local public services specifically dedicated to seniors to combat isolation, assist seniors with the administrative procedures. The department is opening Maison du Bellage throughout the territory. Uh, the project begins, uh, began in the uh, end of uh, 2017 with one uh, Maison du Bellage. Now we have already 33 Maison du Bellage uh, already opened on the territory. Uh, the main missions are described in form orient, accompany, uh, ensure a health watch, offer activities that against isolation and prevent dependency, and uh, at last we introduce public service throughout the region with the French post office. Next slide, please. You can see uh, the, the, the population uh, on, this, uh, on this project. Uh, we have an average age about uh, 177. And they, um, of course, there's a lot of difficulties with uh, uh, digital inclusion with this population. And we see uh, we have uh, more than uh, uh, 25,000 queries uh, linked to a digital process, we already uh, proceed with this population. Next slide, please. So the department has attempted to have a comprehensive strategy decline into four axes. Help, train, provide computer equipment, fun and well-being. So we focus on the first one, help. Next slide, please. So uh, on this Maison du Bellage, we have agents that are um, here to help people, seniors, on the uh, administrative procedures, in particular those online who are more difficult for this population. We also have uh, another um, mobile Maison du Bellage, a connected caravan, who travels the department to bring this new public service closer to the people. And uh, we have now a specific uh, uh, operation uh, due to the vaccination. So we uh, have we set up a, um, a call center dedicated to seniors with online, online appointments, scheduling enable the vaccination. Next slide, please. Uh, we try to, training is very important for this population. So we, uh, we have now uh, uh, training sessions uh, about 12 hours in the use of laptops for absolute beginners. And uh, the target is to uh, be able to, to form about uh, 3,000 to 5,000 seniors. And we have also a, a, a personal uh, accompaniment to this uh, population on the Maison du Bellage. They can have help specifically on your iPhone, tablet, or laptop. Next slide, please. Uh, we identify also that the lack of uh, equipment uh, is one of the most important difficulties encountered in the digital divide. So to fight effectively against the digital divide and reach the senior population not equipped, with computer equipment. Uh, after a successful uh, experiment, we try to, uh, to bring this new service uh, in the Maison du Village 
a system for lending tablets with 4G package on it. The loan is for a few months, and we, uh, it's very important, systematically proposed with training sessions. That's very, very important. So these tablets are uh, specially designed for senior citizens. Uh, uh, very simplified interface, uh, large case, etc. The target is to deploy about uh, 5,000 tablets on the territory, so we uh, will be able to uh, to have uh, a population who can use it about uh, 10 or 15,000 of seniors. Next slide, please. One important thing. Uh, um, especially on this uh, context COVID, is uh, to, uh, to have uh, uh, an approach of the digital inclusion with uh, fun also and well-being. So for that, we uh, developed two projects. One is uh, game consoles uh, on the Maison du Bellage. We know that uh, the, the positive effect of the, the gaming for this population and another, uh, we have uh, some workshops uh, from uh, initiation to uh, virtual reality with uh, travel, relaxation, and cognitive stimulation modules. Uh, this activity is really, really successful uh, during the experimental phase. Uh, and I say that because now with the context COVID very, uh, um, very hard uh, on the territory, we stopped all the um, uh, group activity. We do only uh, individual uh, activity because uh, of the uh, context uh, sanitary. Uh, this activity was successful and will be offered uh, in all the Maison du Bellage, uh, but when the uh, context COVID will permit it, of course. So I think I will I have finished my presentation. Thank you very much. I mean, it was, it's very nice to see that I think in very different places we're trying to focus on you know, on aged people on the, this the golden age we will see more than silver that has suffered a lot during this pandemic and they also deserve much care. Well, now I will pass to the Central Director for Health, Social Policies and Disability of the Autonomous Region of Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, um, La Dottoressa Gianna Zamaro. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me to this conference. Um, I'm talking about the rule of families uh, at the time of COVID. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted everyone in all sectors by changing people's habits and lifestyles, including those of children and teenagers who have found themselves no longer at school and now having to cope with distant learning, something they had never done before. There has uh, undoubtedly been a situation of frustration and demotivation and been defined particularly in adolescence at the time when their identities are taking shape and they should be outside the home strengthening the relation with their peers. So we made a survey, survey during the first phase the results were carried out by one of our two universities in, uh, in the region on a sample of parents. It reveals that some somatic problems, anxiety and depression were more marked among children and teenagers uh, who had more anxious and depressed parents and among older children uh, and those who did not have a circle of close friends. 
we have to say that uh, um, parenting skills uh, uh, are an essential protective factor. The parents' defensive and supporting attitude plays a decisive role in shaping children's emotional reaction related to stress. The parents uh, are the best behavior model for children and teenagers, and the home is practically the best place to learn life skills. The family has a responsibility to give a positive message and behave in a way that offers the child security. At the same time, parents must grasp any signs, even the smallest one, uh, of suffering or request for help the children may show. Parents must also find a support network and services offered by social and health system to address the situation better. As a result of this uh, uh, survey in uh, uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia, we are preparing a project, a big project, that involves families and local institutions to increase uh, parenting skills, taking into account um, these uh, uh, following six challenges. The first one, parents are advised to give children in a a rhythm, a day routine, uh, with moments dedicated to learning and relationships, a fun, physical activity, rest and leisure, providing moments in which to do activities together to avoid children being exposed to video games for long periods. The second one. Parents need to focus on and intensify messages for, of good behavior instead of concentrating, and this is important, quite important, on bad behavior by providing more prize and social encouragement rather than material encouragement. The third one, during the day, moments of open exchange, conversation and listening are helpful with uh, uh, teenagers in particular, besides recognizing the difficult moment that there must be an opportunity to talk about emotions. It's important for them to understand that uh, there should be an alternative for any disappointment or uncertainty. Parents can include teenagers in the decision-making process, especially in issues involving them. The fourth. Challenge. The continuous search for information about COVID on the internet and repeated exposure information about the pandemic and the number of deaths on TV should be avoided. The negotiation with teenagers are also recommended to limit the time spent on the internet. Children have resisted and excellent resilient skills and must be encouraged to strengthen these abilities. This is the fifth one. The current situation must be seen as an opportunity for all the children to learn responsibility, involvement and collaboration by taking on the daily duties at home, such as taking care of their belongings and items. The last one. At the end, it is essential to enhance the system of peer support for teenagers. Parents should encourage adolescents to keep in touch their peers and communicate with them about their feelings and the common problems that they face. It's quite important. In complex with the rules that contrast the, the spread of COVID, families may agree to organize a stable group of children of the same age, perhaps classmates, who can meet up and have the opportunity to produce and experience the typical behavior of their age. This is uh, uh, all we are uh, doing um, and uh, we, we believe uh, in families. Uh, we believe in the rule of families, uh, um, especially in doing this, uh, this uh, um, difficult phase uh, uh, of COVID. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to, to Dr. Shosamaro. And now I give the floor to the Executive Secretary for Strategic Projects Management of Sao Paulo Municipality, Mr. Alexis Vargas. We are very happy to count on you. And I think this is the first time you are in one of our activities. Please feel very welcome. And you have the floor.
Thank you, Inacio. Do you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much for the welcome. I'm very happy and proud to be here with you. I'd like to start our participation saying hello to all colleagues around the world, as well thanking the meaningful invitation to collaborate and to be here in this powerful exchanging of experience and thoughts. First of all, I will say a few words about a program that is not related to COVID period, the pandemic, but it's directly connected to inclusive cities for sustainable families. Families, especially babies, young children and caregivers, rarely have a voice in urban planning, mobility strategies and programs and service for them. Our program aims to influence child development by identifying and improving the territories where the most vulnerable babies and their families are. We can shortly describe the program and five steps we work it on. The first step was the identification of these territories, the characteristics of the place and the concentrations of public schools of early childhood education. The second step was an analysis on the routes that children take to get to school. They usually go walking. Where are, where are they going? Where are they waiting? Where they, uh, here we began to involve the families and the whole school community on the planning to hear them through the routes they take to go to school. The third step was to design construction, furniture, and signage that simulate develop, that simulates, that stimulates development and protect children on their way from home to school. We defined the educational trails the path to school becomes stimulating and safe with games and wild sidewalks. We define the educational stations, space for families to stop and children to play with appropriate furniture to stimulate child development at this early age. We have defined a traffic moderation measures, uh, traffic moderation measures in this region to ensure the safety and tranquility of parents, caregivers, and children. The fourth step, step was contracting and constructing. The fifth and last step was involving the community on the maintenance of the equipment, which avoid more vandalism than any security system. When the community uh, embraces the, the the service and the furniture and the, the equipment, it, it, it helps a lot of avoiding vandalism. And what results do we expect on this program? Children from zero to six years old in the most vulnerable areas of the city have more opportunities to play and to be in contact with stimuli and induce their, develop, their development. Parents and caregivers interacting more and in a positive way, way with children, using the space and resources of the educational trails and stations. Children of all ages, teenagers, and the community in general, value and care for public space. Reduced rate of traffic accidents in the areas of educational territories. That's why we call this program Educating Territory. The whole territory around the school should be a part of education program. The city must be more welcoming for families and families must occupy and, uh, the space and participate on our city management. And so I, I would like to speak a little bit of some of our special actions for the families with uh, which lost income in this period. As Mira said, uh, we, we are in the, our worst moment here in Brazil. Families have been affected in the hard way, loss of employee and income, raise of domestic violence, school are closed or working at distance. In this particular moment, are all closed here in our city, but they have been closed for a year and have been 
recently open again. We are where we were starting a new period, but came the, the second wave and we close again. It's a, a difficult uh, strategy here to, con to constrain the pandemic with the school open, with uh, rare resource for the children to have uh, distance learning. Well, vulnerable families are receiving food and cleaning kits. The municipality takes care of the distribution of a large number of donations to assure that it impacts life in of the need of the more needed families. So we give some and we organize the logistics for our don uh, for all donations of the enterprise here in the city. Vulnerable families are receiving financial aid paid by municipality in temporary basis. Uh, the federal aid is not enough, so municipality is paying another aid greater than the, the federal one. Families and with children who can't go to school are receiving financial aid for food during this period. The schools are closed because in the school they have five meals a day. So when they get home, uh, the family must feed them uh, much more than they feed during a uh, school period. So they have a special financial aid for food. To bring children back to school uh, with security, we decide to contract some mothers to work with the school implementing sanitary measures. It helps families to be more secure about their children in the school in this pandemic period. It helps family budget, especially for women who were more affected by pandemic economic crisis. So these are some of the, the, the measures we took, especially for this period uh, in, in the pandemic that we are facing the worst time in this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Alexis. And now we go directly from Sao Paulo to the city of Vicenza in the north of Italy. We will have Mr. Um, Matteo Tossetto, who's the member of the Municipal Committee in Charge of Welfare and Family Issues. Se abbiamo imparato qualcosa dal Covid-19 è che per aiutare le persone oggi più in difficoltà è che dobbiamo fare squadra tra ente pubblico, privato sociale e cittadini. Il bisogno di sostegno delle famiglie vicentine è ulteriormente cresciuto a seguito della nuova emergenza sanitaria, che ha ulteriormente aggravato le condizioni economiche di una parte della popolazione. Una significativa percentuale di famiglie precedentemente sconosciute ai servizi sociali del Comune di Vicenza, a seguito della perdita o riduzione del reddito dal lavoro, è in condizioni oggi di non poter neanche prevedere ai, ai propri bisogni essenziali. È necessario perciò che la comunità risponda in modo organizzato e collettivo, sia per non sprecare le risorse a disposizione, sia per garantire aiuti che non ledano la dignità della persona e prevedono contestualmente un accompagnamento al recupero della propria autonomia. Ecco perché il Comune di Vicenza ha voluto mettere in campo una strategia volta a stimolare la collaborazione appunto tra ente pubblico e cittadini che uniti da un patto di collaborazione sociale e civica con noi, con l'amministrazione e con il privato sociale si attivino per sostenere le persone più fragili attraverso la creazione di un emporio solidale. Il coordinamento degli interventi di sostegno delle famiglie in difficoltà realizzati durante il primo lockdown dell'anno scorso conferma come un'organizzazione centralizzata con una forte presenza dell'amministrazione comunale nell'individuazione delle famiglie in difficoltà e con procedure condivise tra i vari soggetti del privato sociale unite al fondamento supporto del mondo del volontariato riesca a rispondere in modo e in maniera efficace ed efficiente ai bisogni dei cittadini più fragili. Ad oggi sono più di 3.000 le persone su 110.000 abitanti del Comune di Vicenza, con il 25% di minorenni destinatari di borse alimentari da parte dei servizi sociali del Comune di Vicenza e della rete del volontariato. 
Si tratta di un dato esploso con l'emergenza economica, seguita appunto da quella sanitaria. Per queste persone l'amministrazione vuole creare un empolio solidale, per le cui ideazione e realizzazione si è scelto in un percorso di comprogettazione, rivolta alle realtà che già operano in questo campo. Non solo un grande negozio di beni alimentari o di beni di prima necessità, ma anche un luogo dove ascoltare le persone e aiutare queste persone in difficoltà a rendersi di nuovo autonome. Sarà molto di più di uno spazio dove distribuire in modo organizzato e razionale le eccedenze alimentari o le donazioni. Ed è per questo che abbiamo chiamato raccolta tutti i soggetti del terzo settore per condividere un percorso di coprogettazione. Il Comune metterà a disposizione gratuitamente uno spazio di 400 metri quadri individuati all'interno del mercato autofrutticolo, dove allestire l'esposizione della merce, stoccarla e mettere a disposizione degli sportelli di sconto. I partner del terzo settore che aderiranno al progetto dovranno fornire le risorse economiche, strumentali e umane per la sua concreta realizzazione e collaboreranno nell'organizzazione dell'attività dell'approvvigionamento, dal recupero delle eccedenze dei nostri supermercati e quindi integrare le donazioni dei nostri cittadini, sottoscrivendo appunto dei protocolli e accordi con i produttori e con gli enti del territorio. Chi avrà diritto a fare la spesa all'interno dell'impoglio solidale potrà contare su una card che conterrà dei punti per l'approvvigionamento caricato mensilmente sulla base di un indicatore economico familiare, cosiddetto ISE, e che dovrà essere appunto corrispondente al, ai componenti del nucleo familiare. L'iniziativa porterà peraltro molteplici benefici all'intera comunità, non solo in termini economici, ma anche in termini sociali, attraverso appunto il potenziamento della rete della solidarietà e anche ambientali, la riduzione degli scarti dovuti appunto alle eccedenze alimentari. Mai come in questo momento ci siamo resi conto appunto di come i servizi sociali stanno cambiando. Con la persistenza della crisi economica il numero dei cittadini che hanno bisogno sta aumentando e l'amministrazione non è in grado di dare un supporto a tutti se non attraverso un lavoro diretto, che coinvolga volontari e privato sociale. Incoraggiare e aumentare la sensibilità dei cittadini sull'importanza di prendersi cura della propria comunità diventa sempre più importante. Thank you very much also to the city of Vicenza. They have worked so much in these months also in this implementing a family perspective. So we go to the next uh, section now and um, we're going we're going to see very very quickly what the future we think it's going to be and for that i had some very very quick polls i would like you to participate at alex if you can show us the first one you see this is a question about um which dimensions of the Venice Declaration you think have been more important because they have been more affected by the pandemic? You can mark one, two, three, as many as you want, but please do it now during some seconds. We will give 15 seconds more. And we will use this for our next meeting. Okay, I think we can close it now. Um, you know that we have said in the email that the deadline for sending the report, the next report will be the 30th of June, okay? 
we understand this is a short uh, a shorter period but i think it's it's very important also because it has been a very intense one but now i'm going to ask with the next poll when you think the next meeting should be hopefully face to face presentially but if, if not we will we will have to do it like this again can you show the next poll alex please so we give like four possible dates which one do you think would be better for that Okay, we will give 10 seconds more. You can mark not only one, but several ones, if you prefer. Okay, and now I'm going to share some suggestions, recommendations that the technical equipment has given us. Uh, let me just try to share my screen here. Okay. So for the next questionnaire, okay, uh, they say, well, it helped them a lot when the questionnaire was fulfilled following these suggestions. First, Completion by quali a qualified employee, I mean people who are familiarized with the different areas. Second, a minimum of words to explain what uh, you will be doing or what you have done about each one of the dimensions. And of course, we're always looking for indicators, measurable data, so like applicable legal instruments. I was talking about the new law in Veneto, uh, budgetary data, because we know that intentions with no budget are <laughs> usually difficult to, to reach. Uh, and then objectives, goals, and deadlines. And finally, of course, the first question, if you remember, the first question asked about the definition does not need to be filled every year if, you've, if your definition remains the same, okay? And you know that the academic team is coordinated by Jose Eduardo and Wilson. You have there the email addresses, okay? So, uh, this is what we wanted to say. Maybe we can have questions or something if you want to know. But first, just the last poll. Uh, Alex, can you show it as the last poll? Um, would you suggest taking out any of these questions, adding another one? We will ask this by email, but just to 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 get an idea. If you think, if you think any of them should be taken out or you would like to add another one, please mark it. And if not, just leave it as it is. We will share the results of all this in the next email we will send with more concrete. Okay, so I think we can, we can finish here, Alex. And now to end up, to end this meeting, I will give the floor to Roberto Ciambetti, President of the Veneto Council, with some concluding remarks that I think are really, really very interesting. As, as they are in Italian with subtitles in English, I hope you can see the subtitles. Um, I can tell you that it was really very interesting to listen to him. And I hope you'll find it as inspiring as I. Desidero ringraziare sentitamente quanti hanno contribuito 
all'organizzazione e gestione dell'evento odierno e penso di interpretare il pensiero di voi tutti nel ringraziare Ignacio Socias e lo staff della IFFD per il grande lavoro svolto non solo oggi ma per quanto hanno fatto in questi mesi. Mi complimento con la loro bella newsletter che la IFFD realizza settimanalmente dandoci informazioni e consigli preziosi anche su aspetti spesso trascurati dai grandi mass media ma che sono importantissimi per la nostra vita quotidiana. Un ringraziamento sincero anche a Uninove per l'attenzione con cui sta seguendo il nostro progetto e per il coordinamento accademico. Infine un sincero grazie a tutte le città e regioni e le associazioni che con il loro lavoro stanno realizzando strumenti e attività per dare concretezza a quanto contenuto nella dichiarazione di Venezia. I miei complimenti alla Carinzia che ha ricevuto quest'anno il riconoscimento della IFFD per l'impegno nel rendere la loro regione la più amica dei bambini e delle famiglie in Europa. Il premio che appunto la IFFD è legato agli obiettivi di sviluppo sostenibili individuati dalla dichiarazione di Venezia. L'esempio della Carinzia è importantissimo per noi tutti. Grazie a voi tutti e grazie anche al network Elisa. Abbiamo avuto la conferma che la dichiarazione di Venezia è stato un documento di straordinaria importanza, capace di individuare con largo anticipo temi e problematiche che proprio durante la pandemia hanno dimostrato la loro centralità nell'azione di contrasto e cura al Covid-19. La famiglia è stata la grande protagonista di una sfida epocale che non aveva alcun precedente nella storia dell'umanità. Se il tessuto sociale non si è disgregato con danni e ripercussioni inimmaginabili, lo dobbiamo proprio alla famiglia, centrale nella cura della malattia, ma anche nella gestione della vita di tutti i giorni. I giorni difficili del lockdown, quanto per la prima volta, chiusi in casa, tanti hanno sperimentato il lavoro da remoto, grazie a internet, che ha consentito, seppur con grandi limiti, anche la didattica a distanza per la formazione dei nostri giovani e a ben guardare è stato un risultato eccezionale. Con questo non voglio certo sminuire lo sforzo incredibile sostenuto dal sistema sanitario di ogni paese, ma medici, infermieri e volontari, uomini e donne che ovunque si sono sacrificati in maniera straordinaria. Se quella contro il Covid è stata una guerra, loro sono stati i nostri eroi. Ma bisogna anche sottolineare che la famiglia ha dimostrato la sua centralità imprescindibile e ribadisco che il mondo post-Covid deve rinascere attorno alla famiglia. La famiglia è la solida base di quell'edificio che chiamiamo società e ciò vale in tutti i continenti, in tutte le diverse realtà culturali del nostro mondo. La dichiarazione di Venezia con i suoi punti è rimasta di grande attualità e io credo che essa possa costituire la base per un confronto serrato attorno alla ricostruzione. Dobbiamo condividere buone pratiche, ampliare la riflessione sugli strumenti che bisogna mettere in campo per dare ulteriore concretezza alle azioni indicate dalla nostra dichiarazione aprendo sempre più il coinvolgimento di nuove regioni e città al nostro gruppo di lavoro e la mia speranza che il nostro gruppo di lavoro possa allargarsi sempre più a realtà del continente asiatico e anche all'Africa. Una indicazione che esce dalla giornata odierna, come da quanto accaduto nei mesi scorsi, è la necessità di organizzare un importante momento di approfondimento sul modello di quanto sperimentato a Curitiba. Appena sarà possibile dobbiamo ritrovarci assieme e assieme immergerci in più giornate di lavoro per fare il punto della situazione e ripartire di slancio dalla nostra azione. Pongo come primario l'obiettivo di una riunione in presenza perché è fondamentale poterci incontrare e assieme politici, amministratori locali, tecnici, ricercatori e università fare il punto della situazione capire quali sono stati i limiti, quali sono stati gli errori, ma anche quali sono stati i punti di forza grazie ai quali l'umanità ha superato una prova epocale. 
la famiglia e l'abitazione sono stati due elementi chiave. Proprio per questo diciamo che le città e l'economia devono essere al servizio della famiglia e non viceversa. L'economia e l'impresa hanno esigenze ben precise, ma solamente una finanza, un'economia e un profitto legati all'etica possono garantire la centralità dell'essere umano e della famiglia. Famiglia e persone infatti devono essere il fine tanto della finanza quanto dell'economia come del profitto. La rinascita post-Covid parte dalla famiglia, dal rafforzamento di una società più sana, libera e solidale, con autodisciplina, senso di giustizia, onestà, moderazione, rispetto della dignità umana, con solide norme, innanzitutto per preservare in economia la concorrenza e il mercato da ogni degenerazione, difendere l'ambiente, evitare sprechi inutili e fare in modo che veramente nessuno sia lasciato solo, nessuno sia lasciato indietro. Se diciamo che la famiglia è il perno della rinascita, dobbiamo anche dire che la famiglia e la casa non possono trasformarsi in prigioni o luoghi di tortura. Non dobbiamo dimenticare che per troppe persone, troppe donne, ragazze e persino bambine, la casa è il luogo di uno sfruttamento inaccettabile, dove talvolta si consumano violenze incredibili e dove quasi sempre si registra una disparità di genere insostenibile. Gli studi dimostrano che le donne hanno il maggior carico di lavoro domestico e di cura e sono le più infelici, ma provano anche a garantire una maggiore serenità per la famiglia, non una divisione al 50% del lavoro tra le parti, bensì una distribuzione che tenga conto della volontà, della disponibilità e delle capacità di entrambi i genitori. Per questo è necessario che la società ripensi al modo di intendere la famiglia e la genitorialità, aprendosi a una nuova idea di comunità e offrendo strumenti concreti per conciliare vita e lavoro di tutti e non solo delle donne. Io credo che queste considerazioni siano implicite nella dichiarazione di Venezia, ma a maggior ragione noi oggi sulla strada della costruzione del mondo post-Covid dobbiamo rilanciarle. Mi scuso se ho parlato troppo a lungo, ma abbiamo tante cose da dirci, abbiamo tante idee su cui confrontarci. Vi ringrazio per la pazienza che avete avuto nell'ascoltarmi e vi assicuro che non vedo l'ora di incontrarvi di nuovo tutti. A voi tutti, dai vostri cari alle vostre famiglie, un grande abbraccio, un vero in bocca al lupo per i mesi a venire. Well, I think with these words we can really now live very inspired for our work in the in the future. I'm just going to show you a, a screen of where you can find all the information you you may need and let me insist that we remain available for any question you have any suggestion maybe i should also say that it's very important that we are able to reach many other territories cities and regions with our project thank you very much and i also hope to see you very very soon face to face uh, yeah, presentially more than electronically, virtually. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Hasta luego. Bye. Bye.